And with that, I think we're going to slowly get started. If we have anyone else joining later, uh, they will just have to uh, catch up uh, to wherever we have got. So um, today, it's a bit of a strange talk in the sense that we don't have a guest speaker. Instead, we've got Robin, uh, Robin Johnson talking, who's our very own chair of Cornwall Science Community, uh, which is also a great pleasure to have a whole talk um, taken over by him, basically. So uh, Robin's got a um, background uh, as a social worker, but obviously his um, breadth of interest is far, far wider than that. Uh, most of you will probably know him either through the um, Falmouth Cafe Sci, uh, which he has been very successfully running for years, or through Cornwall Science Community uh, with a huge different range of topics. Uh, and today he's going to tell us a story about um, John of Trevisa, um, something that he's been thinking about for uh, several years now, I think. And it's a bit of a brainchild, this whole story of this uh, medieval Cornishman. So I'm very interested to find out more about it. So over to you, Robin. Okay, so at this point, um, can we put me on the full screen for a moment, David? There that should be useful. Uh, quite a uh, thank you. Uh, it's just that I wanted to show a couple, two or, th two or three books, which have been some of my source material for a lot of what I'm going to be talking about and exploring. Um, a lot of the research, insofar as you can call it that, is obviously done on the internet these days, and there's huge amounts of information, some of it tantalizingly incomplete, but then that's the nature of the historical record. But we have a few books here, um, a book on John Trevisor by David C. Fowler, who is in effect the expert on the subject, um, another much more in-depth book by the same David Fowler, which has a huge, extraordinary wealth of information teasing out what the implications of various, of what is actually known, what can be decently, reasonably inferred, uh, an extraordinary story, an extraordinary piece of scholarship. Um, and there's also this rather remarkable thing, um, Trevisor of Bar Barclay by Eric Gethin Jones, who was, I think 20, 30 years or so, um, Trevisor's successor as vicar of the uh, parish of Barclay or the uh, chaplaincy of, of, of Barclay and it's an imaginative story he's obviously somebody who was really as captivated as I was by this story to the point where he's written a whole book which is the, almost like the supposed life of Trevisor. Being a cleric he understands a lot more about clerical politics than I do, and there's obviously a lot of clerical politics that you need to understand to get some of this story. Fortunately, I'm going to skip over almost all of that. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make here is that I'm not even a historian. Um, I was, as David says, a psychiatric social worker. And in fact, the more I started to think about what this talk was actually going to be about and what directions we might go in, the more I started finding that the task of translation, which is Trevisor's main field, it's what he's known for, the task of translation isn't just done for translators from one language to another. We are all, to some extent, trying to translate one worldview into another. Certainly psychiatric social workers, our job is to mediate between the social model of causation of mental illness and distress, and say the, the medical, the psychiatric and the legal uh, interpretations. And that kind of go-between bridging role was the day job for me for that all that time. I think scientists are similarly trying to make, trying to forge bridges between one way of seeing things and another way of seeing things. Um, was it Max Planck who said that uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost that one. Um, the, 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 the task of mathematics is to find more and more things that you mean by the same, by a small, smaller and smaller number of formulae. So it's all translating one phenomenon into another. So that's by way of preamble, and I suppose by way of apology for the fact that here's me, not a historian, not an expert in any way on this subject, wanting to talk about it because it seems to me to have all kinds of links and similarities with the world that we are in now, which hopefully we'll pursue later. But that wasn't the reason why I got started. The story of John Trevisor is, I think, absolutely fascinating. He was an extraordinary man in extraordinary times and the relevance the references to our modern day situation 
will come to later. At the moment, I want to try and tell the story. And I'm going to try and make as clear a distinction as I can between the facts as they are relatively well known. There are some facts which are definitely well known. Pretty much everybody agrees that John of Trevisor did X, Y and Z. There's lots of other things which are inference, but pretty strong inference. There are some things which are contradictory, confusing, at best ambiguous, um, and some things which I want to suggest are downright misinformation, deliberate misinformation, for good or ill. So it's a quite a complex story for even a historian to try and tackle, which is why David Fowler gets to, um, I think it's 258 pages in, in his book, including references. So enough of the preamble, let me launch in by sharing my screen, which should be a virtual Cafe Sire Rewrite version two. There we go. So um, I'm going to keep my, um, the, the what's coming up, whatever you call that on, on PowerPoint on the left hand side, just to make sure this, this story goes in so many different directions. There are so many different angles to it. I've tried to produce a narrative as best I could, but to try and keep myself on it, because I'm going to ad lib. I always talk for, relatively without notes. So John of Trevisor, a medieval man of science, question mark. Can we really say that a man writing in the 1380s um, was a scientist or a man of science in anything like a modern sense of the word? Well, clearly not. So I can translate that as a, a, an influential intellectual, because in the era when he was writing, the worldview that they were trying to make sense of was the worldview of Christianity as expressed in in the Bible and as interpreted by scholars, priests and uh, the church hierarchies and so on. The intellectual climate and the intellectual world, in other words, in which he was living and working was very different from ours in, in some key respects. What is striking is the extent to which medieval scholars were developing the skills of dialogue, the skills of, the skills of dispute, the skills of putting forward one point of view and then contrasting it with another, the skills of debate, in other words, which I would argue is actually the foundation of all disciplined thinking and the foundation of the sciences. Now we, we have more abstract methodologies, we use uh, test tubes and microscopes, um, and we have uh, book references and so on and so on and so on, but in the end it is a debate and argument between different positions, and a lot of that was developed by the scholars in the late medieval, the end, towards the end of the Middle Ages. We tend to think of that as the time when clerics were, at, were against science, the whole uh, Galileo version of, of how science and the church are actually opposed, and not a bit of it. The more we understand about um, what was really happening in the medieval world, the more we see the beginning as the foundations being developed. So I'm going to be trying to tell the extraordinary life and the extraordinary times of John of Trevisor. Possibly, I would argue, Cornwall's most influential, forgotten intellectual. Most influential, I will argue, forgotten. I think we could probably say that not many people have heard of Trevisor, which considering what he did and considering his achievement, I think is quite extraordinary and it's something we need to uh, we need to change. For starters, I heard about this through a chance conversation with somebody I've been to a, a talk on the Cornish Ordinalia up in Penryn, that must be five years or so ago, got into a conversation with somebody who told me that this chap John Trevisor, who they think probably was a class name, but they don't know for sure, is, I'm going to use my pointer here, the 18th most frequently cited author in the Oxford English Dictionary, and the third most frequently cited source for the first evidence of a word, the first time a word in English was used, and he is number three in the rank for being the first person to use such a word. If you look at the others, Geoffrey Chaucer, Chaucer and Trevisor in fact are contemporaries, but Chaucer 
was large, well, no, I won't overstate this, a lot of what Chaucer was doing was putting in writing in English the vernacular speech of the age. These were the words that were already in existence, and they appear in writing first when he puts them there in English. And the so he, Geoffrey Chaucer is the first, and the proceedings of the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society is the second most. That's not even a person. That is a whole group of people who published in this August, I presume it's a journal. So in other words, I think that's cheating to say that they have more citations and references than Treviser. Treviser and Chaucer, in other words, are two of the foundation writers, creators of the English language. Chaucer is very, very well known. Treviser is almost completely forgotten. That's interesting. To me, how did that come about? And before we get on to there, my next slide, there are radically differing versions of the significance of Treviser as a writer, as a translator, even within, the, um, within those who've heard of him. So the Dictionary of Na National Biography, back in about 1900 or so, says down here, don't try and read the rest of it because that, I can come back to that later. Or was it, and those are notes for me in case I need them. Treviser was not an original writer, but was a diligent translator of Latin works into English for the benefit of his master, Lord Berkeley. His scholarship is not infrequently at fault, however. Uh, so it's not, it's not infrequently at fault. New glasses. However, the value of his writings is not in their matter, not in what he wrote about, but in their interest as early specimens of English prose. What he wrote about, the Dictionary of National Biography says, what he actually wrote about isn't very interesting, but he was the first person to write in English, so he's an example of prose. Like, what? Compare that with the judgment of a chap called Traugott Lawler, who is, um, who is still alive, who is a professor of medieval English at Yale, but he's now emeritus. I'm going to read this out because I want to give it my particular emphasis, although I'm sure you can all read. What ultimately translates, transcends all these comparisons with other writers, including Chaucer and Treviser, is the scope of the books he translated. The task he undertook, the breadth and sophistication of language, linguistic resources that it required are incomparable. He stands apart from his contemporaries because of the magnitude of his accomplishment, and especially because in translating De Proprietaribus Rerum, which we'll come to, he helped to make English a capable instrument for conveying technical information to the educated man. In other words, he was building, developing, creating, crafting English, not as a, not as a vehicle for uh, poetry and drama and, net and tales, as Chaucer did, but a, an instrument for conveying technical information to the educated man. He was the founder, I'm going to argue, of a lot of the scientific vocabulary that later generations built on and built on and built on. And he did so in an English that even for the most technical, medical, botanical or physical material, that's the stuff he covered, is surprisingly fluent and competent, or by his own criteria, accurate, intelligible and idiomatic. In other words, his own criteria, according to Lawler, were obviously put in medieval English, accuracy, intelligibility, and the use of idiomatic language. This man was involved in what we would now call the public engagement with, perhaps not science, but certainly the intellectual currents of his age. So I think we in the Cornwall science community who are interested in public engagement could fairly plausibly argue that Treviser was the first Cornishman to begin this process. We'll come back to the Izzy Cornish bit in a second, but just a couple of things. 
Um, most of you in the science community or in the science um, writing and science fiction writing will know of Isaac Asimov and his well-known phrase, the most exciting phrase to hear in science. The one that heralds the most discoveries is not Eureka, I've got it, but that's funny. It's when something seems odd that you get the really interesting question. It's not when you know the answer, but when you're going to start to look. And to me, the contrast between Treviser's reputation, those two wildly diverging versions of, of his significance, that's interesting. That's what got me started on looking at what he was about. And just to make sure that we are, after all, the Cornwall Science Community, so I just wanted to reference our, we came into, into existence as a local branch of the British Science Association. British Science Association's version, their account of what science is, is extraordinarily broad. It's any disciplined, accountable form of thinking, whatever the subject. There is no subject matter, which is, this is science subjects, and these are humanities and social sciences and, and so on. As far as the British Science Association is concerned, it comes within their overview. If you approach something with some kind of rigor, some kind of discipline, and in particular, accountability to others for your views in a way that an artist does not need to be. An artist is uh, accountable perhaps to the, to the people who buy their work, um, and that's how their reputation, but no one says that poem is inaccurate. That's just an inappropriate way to measure the success of a poem. It is, but in science, in any, and that, that therefore to my mind includes history. If you are accountable to others for your judgments, that is within that purview of disciplined thinking. So what I want to argue therefore is that although Trevisa, here's the man himself, wasn't a scientist in the sense of studying things using the modern technologies and tools of science, but he was certainly somebody who tried to understand and tried to share the extraordinary breadth of knowledge that was around at his time and to share that with the general public. So I'm going to attempt now three stories in one. I've already taken about 20 minutes to get started. On the one hand, there's the times in which he lived. Without understanding the times, you cannot understand the man and what he did. Then there's the, the life and works of John himself, the particular trajectory through the world that he took in those remarkably troubled and turbulent times. And then hopefully we can get on to something for the relevance today. So I'd, I'd like to discuss that. So firstly, quickly, roughly, where is he in history? 13, second half of the 13th century, born probably 1342. This timeline here, there's Henry II, Edward the Confessor up here. Um, here we have Magna Carta. Here we have William Caxton's printing press, roughly in between the Magna Carta and the um, foundation, some would argue, of English democracy and the parliamentary system, and William Caxton, the foundation of the technologies for communicating with the rest of the world that then completely transformed our world. Notice down here the Black Death. Right in the midst of this period, we have a pandemic. We have a visitation from God presumably, in the world view of those who understand the world as a creation and God's message to humans. How will people make sense of something like this in their times? Let's zoom in a little bit closer though. We've got Chaucer and John of Treviser. Here he is. There's John and Chaucer, pretty much exactly contemporary. The Black Death appearing Oh, actually, that Black Death is a little later on in, I think, in Treviser's life. Um, so just to zoom in a little bit, Joan of Arc says much further down, the Wars of the Roses much further along. We're locating him, in other words, in what some people would think of as the late Middle Age. But um, it, you might find it helpful to think of it in terms of the period of the Black Death. I think most people have some kind of image of what the world was like in those days. However, it's also the time of Richard II and the deposition 
of Richard. This so ignore the text here. That's um, somehow got carried over from something else. Um, the deposition, the dethroning, and later murder of Richard II. This is the time when the barons rose up, not just to hold the king to account, but to displace the king. And if you think of the theological significance of that, there is around this time a lot of debate around the role of church and state. The state had the power, the church had the authority, the legitimacy, I think we, we, could, we could say. And the overthrow of a king around the time when people were starting to talk about kingship as having some kind of authority coming even from God. The overthrow of the king is as much a challenge to the world as things like the Black Death. It is a highly turbulent time. Um, there we have the death of Richard II at the end of John of Trevisor's life. The significance of that will hopefully come to later. But the other thing that's worth mentioning here, da, 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 where is it? Da, 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 da. Yes, there we are. The Peasants' Revolt, coming sometime two thirds of the way through John's life. And the peasants, influenced by a preacher I'm sure you'll have heard of called John Ball, arguing when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? What they'd realized was that there's no mention of gentry in the Bible. The authority of the, um, the landowners was not something that had any biblical sanction. Meantime, you also have around the same period, John Wycliffe, who is known as having been the author or creator, instigator of Wycliffe's Bible. And he is arguing, trust wholly in Christ, rely altogether on his sufferings, beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by his righteousness. And what he's saying there is, priests, clerics, the church, these are in the way of that personal relationship with Christ as they conceive. Wycliffe narrowly escaped being burnt at the stake, he narrowly escaped being prosecuted by a number of authorities, including obviously the, uh, the church. So this is an extraordinarily dangerous belief an extraordinarily dangerous argument at what are already extraordinarily dangerous times that questions the authority of the church, questions the role of the church. Around this time, so a little later, King James Version of the Bible says, much about that time, talking of the 1380s, even in our King Richard II's days, John Trevisor translated them, the Bible and the scriptures, into English. The King James's Bible, commissioned and directed by the king as the first official Bible in English, as against other versions that were circulating at the time, attributes a version of the Bible to John Trevisor. Now, you put that together with the judgment that as a translator, he had extraordinary breadth and created the language that we then use for scientific and technical discussions in English. And a suggestion that he was also translating or translated the Bible. And it's hard to see why this man should be now so forgotten in Cornwall. So that's interesting in Asimov terms, that's funny. What I want to do is try and tease out something of the story. And I'm going to try and make a distinction here between the, the version that a historian, a proper historian would give, the, th the stuff that was pretty much grounded in fact, and a rather more dramatic interpretation, because I think this is such an extraordinary story, I can't resist teasing out some of the things that might have been going on which made it make it even more explosive. Firstly, why do we say John Trevisor was Cornish? 
What reason is there? We have nothing whatsoever to go on. Well, tree pollen pen, by tree pollen pen, you know the Cornish man. He has a Cornish sounding name. Um, we'll later find, I'll come back to it a, a little bit later on, that he refers to Cornwall in some of the notes of one of the um, books he translated that suggests quite a lot of uh, knowledge and indeed interest in Cornwall. But apart from that, there's not a lot to go on other than the fact that a generation or two previous, there were people with the name of Trevisor in and around the area of Summercourt, which is now on the on the A30, um, and one or two of them at different times were MPs for the area. In fact, they were MPs for a long, for different areas for different times. I really don't understand how being an MP worked in those days. But it does seem that there was a family, the Trevisors, who lived and possibly farmed in and around this area, and who may or may not have been um, the kind of connected with the gentry in, in some way. But a lot of that is very hard to interpret. Sometimes the spelling is inaccurate. Sometimes you can't be sure which person they're talking about. It's pretty plausible though. And I think just about most people now say, John of Trevida pretty clearly was Cornish and pretty clearly came from the town or the village as it, uh, as it is now of Trevisa or Trevesa, which is near some court. Hence it's called John of Trevisa. Interestingly, that would mean that uh, living and being brought up in middle to west Cornwall, he would be familiar with Cornish. It would be the language of the Cornish, of the people he lived, lived amongst. So here's a man already speaking Cornish. If he wants to go into any form of education, then he's going to have to have some English and some Latin. He's already trilingual. But let's have a look. That little red dot is Treviso. Here we have uh, clay country, all in white. This is the satellite map, so that's why the clay country is white. Um, that's it. Goodreve is down here. St Morgan and the airport is up here. This is where we are in what, what I think of as central Cornwall. So we know that John Treviso went to Oxford because there are records of him renting rooms there and there's a lot more to that story which we'll come back to. How does this young man at the age of 20, he goes to Oxford, get from um, somewhere in a pretty uncouth part of the world? I mean you should read the comments of the bishops of Exeter, some of them, on what they made when they try going down into Cornwall to, to pick up the um, um, the, the funding um, for, for some of the, the colleges they, they set up. We know that Bishop um, Branscombe set up Glasney College and so there were some people who were you know, pretty sympathetic to the idea of instilling learning in this faraway remote corner of the, uh, of the kingdom. Um, but how does this young lad from what appears to be the, the sticks end up in Oxford? Well, the obvious thing is he went to Glasney. Somehow or other, he went to the Ecclesial, Ecclesiastical College, which was a seat of learning, the only seat of learning in Cornwall at the time. So he almost certainly must have gone to Glasney and there got the education. How he came to be there, there's different possible interpretations, but it seems highly plausible that the Bishop of Exeter at the time would have sponsored or in some ways um, assisted or advised or in some way or other got him to there. Because certainly when he then goes to Oxford, to the University of Oxford, he enters the college which has been set up by the bishops of Exeter for local scholars and local priests and local clergy. Oxford at that time was primarily a site for learning and learning was primarily associated with the church, with the monks, the friars and a group called the secular clergy. 
Now, secular obviously has two very different meanings in, in the, current, the current day, but I believe even, with, even now within the church, there is a phrase secular clergy, which is not a contradiction in terms of it's just a different meaning of the word secular. But you had the seculars and the regulars. The regular students were the people who followed the rule. The rule would be the rule of St. Benedict, the rule of St. Augustine. They were the monks and later the friars um, who went to ecclesiastical colleges as part of their education and training. The seculars, so far as I can understand, and I'm hoping that someone's going to correct me on this or get me more accurate, the seculars seem to have been primarily parish priests. Or well, certainly there were people who were out there in the community with roles within the local church and the local um, establishment. And it seems that between the seculars and the regulars, there were some tensions. There were some frictions, to put it mildly. Quite what they were all about is, takes about 30 pages or so of David Fowler's brilliantly insightful book. And I have to say, having kind of read through most of it, I'm still not at all sure I've understood it. What is clear was that there was some kind of power struggle between the seculars and the regulars as students at the university, each with their own different college. So this is a college to college fight and battle. At some point, possibly due to the decimation of one of the colleges in deaths through the plague, a number of students moved from the college that the Exeter Bishop had set up to one of the other colleges. Perhaps they just needed tenure. Perhaps they became fellows. I'm not quite sure why it happened, um, but there were certainly enormous frictions because at one point John Trevisor and a number of his, his colleagues who he knew and who he moved with him, I'll read this out for you, together with Whitfield and some others were expelled from the college in from the college by the Archbishop of York for their unworthiness, for conduct unbecoming a scholar. Get a young lads together, go to university, who knows what that might be? Well, it sounds like they've done something a bit scurrilous. Let's read on. The excluded fellows, I should say, although I'm quoting from the National Biography History uh, Dictionary, which I'm a little bit scathing about their judgment, all the rest of this is pretty much factual from college records. Uh, and not just college records. The excluded fellows, those who'd been expelled, carried away certain monies, charters, and other property of the college. They were excluded, but they took with them some stuff, money. This, this sounds like extremely irresponsible behaviour, does it not? Um, in 1379, the Chancellor was ordered to inquire into the matter, and after some delay, the property was restored. Some delays putting it mildly. There were petitions to the Crown, Parliament, and the King had to intervene to insist that the group of scholars who had been expelled gave back the stuff that they had taken. The Crown had to intervene. So, so far, it sounds like John was a bit of a sort of rebellious, bit of a tear away, got, gets his comeuppance, and he's, he's sent down, effectively. And that seems to be, from the Dictionary of National Biography, that seems to be it, except that he's then picked up, and he next appears at Barclay Castle in Gloucestershire um, as a tearaway and among one, one of a group of thieves, that's a slightly unusual thing to happen, but he wasn't in the prison cells, he's there as the chaplain for Lord Barclay. So this is quite a promotion, effectively, for a man who's just been expelled from college. Again, that's funny, as Isaac, as, Asimov would say. He's there as the personal confessor and 
one reading is that he'd actually been the tutor for the young Thomas Barclay, the, the Lord of Barclay Castle. And at Barclay's request, he translates a whole series of books. Now, the, the list I have here is pretty much seen as being judged by medievalist historians as, as accurate. Only some of them actually have absolute clear indications that it was Treviser himself who did the translation. Only two of them actually have dates. You see here the Polychronicon and the Proprietatibus. Sometimes it seems to be Proprietatibus, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that spelling is. Um, there are two books that are dated. All the others, we don't know when he wrote them. They've been put into a sequence here, which suggests a timeline, suggests a development of ideas. Whether they are Barclay's ideas, because Barclay has commissioned these translations, or whether they are the things that um, that Treviser himself was interested in, that we have, you could, you could read that either way. So it suggests that, the, that this is the order in which they may have been written. The Gospel of Nicodemus is one of the parts of the Bible that, we, that is apocryphal, an alternative version, a part of the New Testament. The dialogue between, the, between a Lord and a cleric um, was one of the books, ah, oh, now I'm getting my head of myself, some of the material that that group took from college when they were expelled and were forced to give back wasn't just goods and money and gold and whatever else people might, might think. It was books or scrolls. And one of them is the dialogue, which is a debate on the relationship between the secular authority, i.e. The, the king, the crown, and the religious authority of the church. So it, it's a debate about the relationship between church and state at a time when both the authority of the church and the authority of the state were very much up in the air. But as a very, very simple version, you could say the church had authority over people's souls and the state had power over their, their bodies and the land. So the debate between them being discussed amongst scholastics and, and um, and um, within the church hierarchy at the time is obviously at that time a really hot topic. Defensio Curatorium is an, a book by a, another chap who I don't know much about, but it appears to be an attack on the growing power of the friars within the church. So the book that, or one of the books um, that he translated is a book it's precisely about that debate and tussle that had seen him expelled from Oxford. So you start to think, hold on, he's expelled for conduct unbecoming and takes away the dialogue and the defensio curatorium. It seems he may have also taken away a book called the Polychronicon, which is a history of England. Um, I, I think I'll pause for the moment on the rest of the story. As I say, you can go in so many different directions with it, and it is such an extraordinary story. I'm going to pause for a moment. We've already had this. Um, <laughs> I seem to have got double slides there. Because the two books I particularly want to focus on that are his translations. One is, as I said, the Polychronicon, the history, and another one, Proprietatibus, the book, the effectively the book on the science subjects. This was a summary of what was known, written by um, Bartolomeo. Bart no, I'm not sure the pronunciation, I should have written this down. But it's, uh, it is, a, in effect, an encyclopedia at the time, and it was seen as the most up-to-date, the most comprehensive overview of all scientific knowledge. So you've got the history of England, and you've got all known science being translated into English by this man who's been chucked out of the college. 
Well, it turns out that even while being chucked out of the college, actually he continued to pay rent there on and off for a number of years. So the story is far more murky. Um, I, there is one statement in the Polychronica, I did say I would get back to this, because it may be one of the reasons why he's not so well known in Cornwall. Um, I'll, I'll <laughs> it is a wonder why Alfred summers, Alfred, I think is, is King Alfred, sums up the shires of England some deal in as a man that dreameth. For Alfred telleth the sum of shires in this manner, there be in England six and thirty shires without Cornwall and without the islands. Why saith he not in this manner, in England there be seven and thirty shires, and so is Cornwall accounted with the other shires. And that is skilful, for Cornwall is a shire of England. Departed in hundreds, I divided into hundreds in the Saxon way, ruled by the law of England and has shire days as other shires do. He comments, in other words, on Cornwall, contesting the idea that Cornwall is a separate part, not part of England. It is the further bit of um, circumstantial evidence that Trevisor's connection with Cornwall was more than just that of a translator coming across a phrase in a book. It does suggest that this man was from Cornwall, concerned to insist that Cornwall, when, by inference, he comes from, is a legitimate part of England. He's got as much right to be there doing things in English as anybody else. I love this last phrase. If Alfred saith nay to that, he wot not what he maffleth. He wot not, he, as in, you know, uh, Trevise's translations are sometimes quite argumentative, sometimes quite contentious. He's not at all afraid to give his own opinions. And he's quite a, a uh, truculent observer and comments. So this is the Polychronicon that has the history. Um, we also have De Proprietatibus Rerum, the, which includes me mentions of some of Aristotle's recent writings that have recently been translated into Latin, recently discovered and translated into Latin in this book in, in English. And Trevisa is translating, is making those Latin books, including Aristotle, available to the English. Um, Bartholomeus Anglicus, I, that was the name I was struggling to, to get. Um, this is just one of a whole string of comments on uh, the language that Trevisa developed. Um, but it's something is the first occurrences in English of accidentally alteration, apprehend, apprehension, they're clearly working their way through the alf alphabet, associate, atom, communicable, communicative, complement, convenience, cooperate, dimensions. These are the lang these are the words that Trevisa is introducing into the English language. And as one of the other commentators, I'm not quite sure, I think I decided not to have too many slides. One of the commentators points out that Anglo-Saxon had relatively few abstract words. Almost all the language of abstraction was in Latin. So to translate the Latin into English, he had to create words in English that did not exist before, for concepts, for abstract concepts. And this is the legacy in terms of science and in terms of the, the foundation, the counterpart to, jo to Chaucer in his creation of literary English. This is the basis of the, of the suggestion that, uh, that Trevisa was one of the cornerstones of the English technical vocabulary. But what I'm interested in is not that bit, the bit that I find absolutely fascinating, absolutely extraordinary, and the bit that has me saying, this man was at the cusp of the modern age in so many ways, not just in his translations of science, but that book, The Polychronic on the History, the one original bit of writing that is attributed, well, no, that John Trevisor definitely did produce, the one thing that he wrote himself, rather than translating 
the works of others and bringing them to the people, although the content of what he wrote is pretty um, inflammatory, granted the times. He writes a, um, an introduction to the Polychronicon as a, what's the word, a gesture of thanks to Lord Barclay for all the work that he's given him in commissioning in, in writing that over the time, over those times. I've <laughs> got a number of, oh dear, 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 a number of messed up uh, double slides. The preface to the Polychronicon is, I'm using Wikipedia here, so you can all double check it. The dialogue on translation between a lord and a cleric is the preface of John Treviser's translation of the Polychronicon written by Hignan, made for his patron Lord Berkeley. So far, so good. Written in Middle English, so far, so good. It consists of a series of arguments made by the cleric, who is, represents Tre Treviser, on why books should not be translated from learned language such as Latin. So he's putting in the mouth of the cleric the arguments for not doing what he spent his life doing. He puts in the mouth of the Lord, each one it says, followed by a rebuttal from the Lord, representing Lord Barclay. The clerk eventually is won over, he agrees, and the dialogue continues with a prayer for guidance for his translation. In the book that he wrote, he puts in the mouth of the Lord all the arguments for doing what he had done, and he puts in his own mouth all the arguments for saying, well, are you sure this is the right thing to do, and could it not be difficult and problematic, and so on. The, uh, the clerk is full of sort of timid and submissive opinions, which would be the opinions of the church. I'm overstating, but because within the church there were clearly many different factions, but certainly there were powerful factions in the church that said you should not translate the Bible into English, although it seems pretty clear that he did. So, another, if you want to look this up, um, the character of the Lord explains that the use of Latin as a universal academic language, which is one part of the problem, of diverse languages, but the other remedy is translation. So Latin is useful insofar as it allows people from different countries to speak to each other, but that's then ex exclusively in a small group of people, basically the clerics, and that denies the understanding of these pieces to the average of the rest of the population, and translation is the way to make this knowledge, this wealth of knowledge and argument and disputation, to make it available. And that is, put, those words are put in the mouth of the Lord. Now, let's go through briefly, I'll hop over here a bit. Thomas Barclay, the Lord in question, at his birth, brought together the blood of the baronial families of Barclay, Dispenser, Mortimer and Clare, four of the principal dynasties central to the struggle a generation earlier between the barons and Edward II. We are talking seriously powerful people here and it seems to me that Treviso puts in the mouth of some of these extraordinarily powerful people the defence of the position that, that he's taken all his life whilst he himself appears to be, appears to be doubting it. So far, so good. Now let's go back briefly to, I, I've shown you the book of David Fowler, who is effectively the key scholar. Fowler died about um, 15 years ago. Uh, and I've been trying to get hold of a picture to see if we could, see this man who unraveled much of this story. I uh, so far have only get, managed to get two pictures. I'm not even sure if it's the same person. I'm not even sure if one, which one is the picture of, of Fowler. 
Um, I've been to the university, they passed me on to the old library, they passed me on to the Seattle Examiner, who had a picture of him based on some time many, many years ago. It's somehow wonderfully appropriate. <laughs> the key scholar here is as difficult to track and difficult to, to pin down as the subject he wrote about. But according to the book, as I understand it, when you look at the actual things that the group expelled from Oxford took with them, um, the list is here. Anybody who's interested, I can find, I can send it on to you. I'm not in any position myself to judge, but Fowler's view was, was that these were exactly the books that you would want to take with you if you were translating the Bible. Now, it's circumstantial evidence, but it seems that, that Trevisa may have been expelled from the Oxford College with that group that had moved with him to this new college, not for conduct unbecoming a scholar, not for theft of the properties, but as some kind of power battle within the college as to whether or not they should be translating the Bible. And Wycliffe is one of the people in the, these colleges at the time, not actually in the same college, curiously. In other words, Wycliffe or Wycliffe has a group of people who he has brought together to work on the translation. And that seems to fit with the view that Trevisa was either one of, or it would seem probably the key person translating the Bible into English at a time when that was an extremely dangerous thing to do. So we have a man who has translated the history of England with all kinds of inaccuracies in it. We have a man who has brought the most comprehensive compendium available at the time on botanical, medical and physical sciences, and the man who seems to have translated the Bible into English at the time when the Peasants' Revolt was talking about the Bible not having any reference to uh, the gentleman, and when Wycliffe was saying, do not rely on priests and scholars, they're not mentioned in the Bible. There is no biblical authority for the church as it existed. This is an extraordinary radical thing to do, an extraordinary dangerous thing to do, and the way that Trevisa, towards the end of his life, puts the defence of what he's done, not in his own mouth, not in his own words, but he, he puts all the sort of pusillanimous arguments into his own mouth and has one of the most important, one of the most powerful people in the land saying, oh no, it's perfectly right, it's just the right thing to do, just what, just what we needed. Um, one of the books that he, that he translated, um, I'll, I'll not go back to it because I'm already way, way, way over time, um, is a, a book, I think, from Greek that talks about the difference between a king and a tyrant and the times when it is appropriate to contest and to overthrow a king. This is in the years before Richard II is deposed. This was extraordinarily political, extraordinarily risky, and he manages it in this wonderfully insouciant way of using an academic disputation model to cover his tracks. And that surely is time enough for me to stop and see if I can field any questions. But if, if nothing else, I hope I've got people interested in saying, this man should not be forgotten. This is somebody we should name libraries after. Well, okay. I'm sure there's masses of inaccuracies in what I've said. I've tried my hardest to be 
to stick to the truth and not let the extraordinary story carry me away. But I'm sure that there are points at which I've over egged the story and gone beyond my brief. But there we go. Time now for me to sit back, take a sip of my non-alcoholic beer and find out what you all make of it. Thank you very, very much, Robin. Um, yeah, that was great. The only uh, way I had heard of John Treviser before this was as one of the longest lived men in, of the age, uh, which obviously does not cover anything whatsoever of what you've um, been taking us through. Yeah, really great story. Um, I can see why you, when you initially uh, mentioned this whole idea to me, you said that it could be a great film or something. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, my feeling, knee yeah. high, miracle, um, you know, golden tree, where, where, you know, you ought to be doing, Colonel King, you know, this would make a great drama. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, if anybody does have any questions, um, comments, uh, conversation starters, you, anything, uh, please do pop it into the chat. So um, as I said already at the bottom, if you're unfamiliar, you should find the button for chat and the chat window on the right hand side uh, will pop up. So uh, in the meantime, while everyone's getting geared up a little bit, uh, I just wanted to comment that, uh, especially, I mean, you highlighted really, Robin, the part with translating the Bible able into English I was yeah a bit blown away by uh that fact I just didn't realize that anyone would have done it at that time seeing as um it's such a not done thing dangerous thing right so uh, I thought it wasn't until years and years afterwards that people were even thinking about that mm -hmm. and I do love how you uh, yeah. pitch tries as one of the um, first science communicators of the age um putting the link to yeah, while I'm waiting for other people to perhaps get geared up a little bit, I did have one question or um, comment that you're seeing if you happen to know anything about it. So um, you mentioned with the various texts that you translated, especially with this um, dictionary of sorts, that um, he was one of the first people to mention a lot of different words in English. So I was wondering if there's any evidence that he actually invented many of these abstract terms yes. or it was merely the first one to happen to write down yeah uh, my, my it's only inference and, and you would need to be a far better linguistic scholar than, than i am but as i understand it chaucer uses in english a lot of words that were already commonly around but had never been written down and chaucer in fact did do a lot of translation himself and did invent quite a lot of words but no um, he, Trevisor, had to create new words. He had to invent words and make them as idiomatic as possible in order to be un to be understood. But he he didn't um, just use words that were around. Those words did not exist in the English language. That way of thinking, that abstract thought, Latin did that. Anglo-Saxon didn't. That, at least, is the view of some of the scholars that I've been reading up on. I can't claim to, have to, to say that's my own judgment or my own opinion. I'm not qualified to, to say that. But that is what is said. Um, as it was first introduced to me, a, a lovely example was, um, I mean, Atom was one of the ones on that. But does the phrase lukewarm make sense when you think about it? Lukewarm. What is lukewarm well apparently Trevisor suggested that lukewarm is the warmth that things get when they've been left out in the sun luci so he had a way it seems yeah. of bringing together bits that people could make sense of putting them with something else that they also were familiar with to create a kind of a new 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 word honestly this is not my judgment this, i'm only passing on what i've heard from others but it does seem that he was the first to suggest words that didn't exist whereas chaucer many of the words that he wrote down would have been in common parts would, would they wouldn't have made good yeah. jokes otherwise would they Great, thank you. Uh, some really interesting discussions in the chat now about um, involving the Cornish language as well, uh, with oh, yes, out yes. that Cornish did act, the Cornish language did have abstract concepts. So uh, maybe I'm wondering if that's why he was more familiar with this sort of abstract thinking than other contemporaries might have been. I, 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 would, I would 
have to defer to anybody who knows examples of those abstract concepts being used at that time, and I'm not sure who would have written them down. But there is a suggestion, although it is way, way, um, it, it, it's not well confirmed, should we say. There are references to a Cornish Bible. And if there are, if there was a Cornish Bible, then I can't think of any other plausible person <laughs> who that might have been. But the idea that Trevisa could write a Cornish Bible whilst doing all the other stuff, um, I, I, don't, I can't say. But yes, it may well be that Cornish language had some abstract concepts. A lot of Cornish uh, times is quite similar to French. And it may be that some of the cultural connections within the Britonic language group that were kind of knocked aside by the arrival of Anglo-Saxon, uh, I, I simply, I, I, I do not know. It'd be, it'd be yeah. wonderful to think so. Yeah, absolutely. If, I mean, that would be a, that's a subject for somebody else's master's or PhD. <laughs> Yeah, there are suggestions in the chat as well that there can be a lot of um, discussions on this. Um, so uh, another thing Loveday pointed out was about his anti-Cornish sentiments, which um, Michelle had a great comment on as well. So Michelle says... Um, he's not anti-Cornish, he's, anti he's just saying Cornwall's part of England. But I suspect that that's probably one of the reasons, or it might be the principal reason, why a lot of people, the, the kind of uh, Cornish nationalists or, or people who are very proud of Cornish separatism, Cornish, the, um, well, the, the Cornish has a different identity and, and who see English as the oppressors. They, that will be the reason why he's not seen as a Cornish hero. Yeah, yeah. I mean, saying Cornwall is part of England is enough to get you kicked and out he's, of some Cornish he, circles nowadays. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he, it, this, this, uh, my, my feeling is that most heroes are more ambiguous characters and they've got some great strengths and some great weaknesses. I'm, I'm prepared to see that as a uh, a weakness, but he was certainly a stroppy bugger. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, he's, a, he, he's you know, he's, he's, he's uh, quite a cantankerous and rebellious, oh, thoroughly opinionated. Again, a lot of the stuff that he wrote, he wrote in footnotes and in, and in Polychron in, Chronicon in particular, I believe. Um, but he wrote explanations as to sometimes why a certain translation was not necessarily the, you know, he, he writes about the, the dilemmas of translating in footnotes. Now, footnotes are absolutely, you know, references are part of the, um, the canonical tradition of science and science writing, where you explain your workings. The Bible, on the whole, did not have footnotes. It had all the authority de definition. So I'm not sure to what extent we could really argue that that in itself, too, was a contribution to the methodological approaches that we then call science, or whether that's probably over-egging it a little bit. Yeah. Now, there's, there's so much around Travis that I don't know, and so much that I guess probably nobody knows. But... The more you dig into it, the more you look into it. There was a, um, a chap who was in the University of Lincoln now, about 10 years or so ago, um, studying some annals and some writings in Wales, in the archives, came across some stuff that he believed was written in Cornish. But because people didn't know the difference between Cornish and Welsh, presumably middle middle-aged Cornish would be even higher. Um, it may be that there's quite a lot of material that's, that actually is written and it's, it's in Cornish, but that we don't, we haven't realised our part of Cornish history. So there's yeah. a whole lid to be lifted there on, on other stuff. I'm, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm motivated. So there's uh, okay. one more point about the Cornish language in the chat uh, made by Michelle earlier, which I was just going to mention before moving on to another subject. So um, that uh, many in contemporary Cornish speakers so, or studying the Cornish language might have viewed Travis as a traitor for working in English and French and not just Cornish, um, which, um, yeah, it's just yeah, another yeah, question. Right. So uh, I think that's probably the reason why he's not seen as a hero of, why he's not seen as a Cornish hero. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm going to 
glance over one of the other questions that Love Day pitched just because we had someone else joining a discussion as well. And I thought I would mm -hmm. try and give everyone a chance. So Steve asks, to what extent might John of Troyza have been able to choose the works that he translated? Or was it just a case of him going with the flow and very much being dependent on what gets commissioned? There, there, are, two, there are two versions of this. The official version is that Lord Barclay commissioned Treviso to do these translations. Um, the equally plausible interpretation, the alternative fact, was that Treviso suggested to Barclay the things that would be good to translate. The fact that some of the things he translated were, was material that he seems to have stolen when they left. Oh, by the way, they, they gave all that stuff back after repeated petitioning from the Crown and intervention of the authorities. And they seem to have hung on to it just long enough to do the work of translation. And then they give it all back. Um, again, circumstantial evidence. Um, but Sorry, I've lost the thread slightly now. Well, anyway, I think you've um, yeah. answered that <laughs> main question already. It's, it's a complex story, and I wander off into some of the other, other aspects of it very, very easily. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are still some fascinating discussions about the Cornish language going on in the chat. So if anyone does have a chance, please do read through it, and I will mm -hmm. pay more attention to it a bit later on. Um, for now, just to keep the discussion. It will be really, really interesting for, for me to hear how much abstract language there was in the Cornish language of the time, because that really would shed a whole new light on Treviser's capacity to come up with versions in English. Perhaps I could answer that. Yeah. Um, obviously, we don't necessarily have texts from the time, but it's thought that a lot of the um, miracle plays, the ordinalias, were based on <laughs> oral, you know, text, oral um, material that was performed earlier than it was written down. And the writing down of it was, um, you know, codifying something that was already in in the con in common speech. And obviously within the Ordinalia and the other saints place, there is a lot of abstract um, Cornish in that related to, you know, religious concepts, but also to other concepts. It was interesting when you were talking about the king and the tyrant, there's that concept is in um, some of the Cornish material. Mm. And, and a lot of the drama behind this is absolutely ordinary type stuff. Isn't it? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to get more people interested in looking at this and, and trying to uh, understand all the different threads and all the different, um, it's a palimpsest this, you know, you scrape away a bit and you find something else underneath and that underneath it. But certainly that idea, for example, I mean, I, I did mean, mention disinformation. Well, on the one hand, the idea that they're sent down for conduct unworthy of a scholar, that's clearly an attempted character assassination of people who were working on a biblical trans, well, on, I, I would say it's clear. Um, but also the disinformation that he himself then puts up with the smoke screen to say that all the arguments for doing what he'd done are put in the mouth of the, of the Lord, a kind of self-protective carapace there. I'd see that as being kind of deliberate um, sleight of hand. Oh, hold on, we have, we have somebody who's far more knowledgeable than, than, than me in a position to put me right here. Can, can we invite Michelle to come on and... and Hi, hi Robin, brilliant, brilliant talk. Now, I think you're absolutely spot on with that. And I can give you a, a slightly earlier parallel for it too. Um, in the Holcomb Bible, um, which I've, I've published and edited, um, there's a similar depiction in which an artist who's working in London is actually allegedly being commissioned by a Dominican to um, do the first uh, graphic novel, if you like, of, of the whole of biblical time and, and history uh, by a Dominican. And it's a fiction. Um, uh, no way is a Dominican going to have commissioned the artist to do what the artist then goes and does. It's again part of a radical agenda yeah. of his own of, of tweaking and revising um, biblical history and relating it to his personal experience. And he's a proto-Lollard 
um, which have caused the Wycliffeites, including Trevi mm -hmm. Teresa R. And they're very dangerous radicals. And so in order to be able to produce this in a book form, the artist actually um, puts a miniature in the front in which he's having a dialogue with a Dominican would-be patron, but no way would a Dominican have, have actually um, sanctioned some of the things that he then goes on to do so i think that's a very similar thing to your your cleric and it's and and I, I, I find this so extraordinarily postmodern yeah. as a way of saying something by saying the opposite or by appearing not to say it or by that's putting right. the, the words uh, can we just go back briefly to the share screen because there's a one little observation I'd, I'd like to draw out here can i yeah okay okay yeah you what should I be was, able to yeah the um the final slide this is the frontispiece. This is the image of the priest and the Lord that, uh, that they use. Look at the body language here. Bearing in mind that Treviser wrote this. I don't know where on earth he got the picture from, but I'm assuming that it's some kind of cartoonized version of them. But the priest is looking kind of timid, slightly shrunken. He's enumerated things. For, uh, points on his fingers but in a kind of unconfident way and look at the body language of the Lord the Lord is the person who clearly knows who is pointing things out who is open and expansive and expression <laughs> just visually the iconography there I'd, I'd love to know where that picture came from did he get it commissioned how would a guy on a priest's salary get that commissioned when this is a gift to the lord of some of the biggest estates in the country, who certainly had the money to do that. You know, it's all circumstantial. I, I, I think Michelle's geared up to oh, picture, oh, so yeah. please yeah, do feel yeah, free. Michelle, in case any of you are wondering why I might know, for about 30 years I was the curator of, of medieval manuscripts at the BL, so this is kind of my, my bag. Yes. Um, it's a standard for, at one level, it's the standard form of... of um, dedication miniature but it is adapted and I think you might find that the it's not just an enumeration there's an element of um, <clears throat> uh, finger enumeration is also a form of um, monastic sign language so there might be actually something being coded in there as well and when you were making your distinction also Robin about um, secular clerics and um, regular uh, um, ordained clerics. Bear in mind many of those involved in, in urban book production in the universities etc were secular canons in minor orders who could be married etc and they were the sort of people that Trevisa and others would and Wycliffe would have been frequenting um, the pubs etc with in, in Oxford before they were booted out and the booting out probably has a lot to do with the fact that they were um, beginning the process of translating the, the Bible that they were mixing in Lollard circles and that they were possibly Possibly absconding with the sort of cortex that they needed to, as you've intimated, in order to be able to get on with their illicit um, and radical uh, research agendas. And yes. it's interesting that the early Lollard books of Trevisa's period aren't all the sort of things that that people would um, secrete and and would would study um, quietly, or that um, people who are purely vernacular speakers would have had access to, because they cite people like Thomas of Woodstock, who's um, from the king's own family, who is one of their leading patrons. So having a patron like Berkeley actually fronting you at a time before it's been publicly con condemned and, and Wycliffe is, is, is denounced as a heretic, um, that it, it's all to play for. There are many of the great and the good who, who, who want to go down this route. And the role of Berkeley, who seems to be using Trevisa in this agenda of democratizing access to scripture, primarily in English, but also in, in Cornish, and whether that's Berkeley, I mean, he's an admiral, he would have had an awful lot of Cornish men in his fleet, for heaven's sake. Um, uh, you know, we don't know, but it, they seem to be interested in, in English and probably Cornish, whereas the things that are just for, for Berkeley himself, for public display, are in um, Anglo-Norman court French. So there's an interesting sort of agenda there. And mm -hmm. Berkeley is one of a number of powerful figures who are being used as a front for the, um, the subversion of, of, of Wycliffe, uh, Trevisa and the Lollard movement. Great, thanks for pitching in again, Michelle, and giving us a, yeah, a more yeah, complete yeah. picture too. Yeah. Uh, we, I, I, I was going to say at the start of our talk, this, this is one of the few cafes I talked with a fact checker. 
Because so, Michelle is infinitely more knowledgeable than, than me about all this. Um, so we probably don't have too, too much time left, but before we wrap up there, I have a, another couple of questions have just come in as well. So Steve asks again, um, this is on a completely different area again now, um, just to get some diversity in again too. Um, do we have any idea how long or uh, what John studied while in Glasny or who might have sponsored that? We have, we have no information whatsoever. There's no record. There's, there's, it's only an inference. Granted that the Bishop of Exeter set up a college, the, the bishops had, um, now let, let me get this right. Michelle, please correct me on this if, if I'm right. But Glasny was supported by funds from a number of different parishes in the area. And so the parishes would send money to support one or two of the people at Glasney College for the education of the, the next generation. And they all came under the Sea of Exeter. Barclay also owned land in that area. So, but either Barclay or the bishop could have spotted this promising young lad. The most plausible thing is that you take him, you get him to Glasney where he learns, and then when he's old enough to go to Oxford, he's there. Whether he's there under the patronage of Exeter or whether Barclay is already involved is not clear. But Thomas Barclay's father dies when he's quite young, he's about 10, 11 or, or so. And Treviser is only about eight or ten years older at that point. So one possibility is that, um, that Treviser was almost sort of father figure, not just father confessor in religious terms, but actually a young, bright young man that Barclay could look up to, could, uh, could relate to. So the relationship between Barclay and Treviser could be quite personal and quite complicated as a, at an emotional level. I did read somewhere, but I've never managed to track it down, that, um, that, that Treviser was tutor to young Thomas, mm. in which case the question of who commissioned who mm. <laughs> has more and more layers. It's a palimpsest. It really is an yes. extraordinary story. It wants a much better script writer than I've been able to. <laughs> it's always more behind the scenes than it seems. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I imagine Man for All Seasons or a kind of uh, Hilary Mantel type writer coming in and doing something wonderful with this story. Oh, hold on, we've got Michelle there. Yep, Michelle, please. As, as far as we can reconstruct the Glasney agenda um, it, as it develops, not how it was when, it, when Branscombe founded it, of course, which is partly his problems with the Earls of Cornwall at that time, but the late medieval agenda of um, Glasney seems to have unpacked as um, part of it was, was taking boys from a range of backgrounds in Cornwall and educating them at Glasney and using it as a feeder into Exeter mm -hmm. College in Oxford to train um, train Cornish boys for the professions, for the priesthood, for the legal and medical professions, mm -hmm. etc. So um, it's likely that Trevisa was part of that intake. Yeah. And as Robin says, you know, as, as the confessor and possibly even earlier the tutor of, of Berkeley, and um, bear in mind we've got the whole sort of um, the Lancastrian and Yorkist stuff is really beginning to kick off at this time. You needed a confessor that you could trust. You wanted your own person in house, um, so you didn't have to confess to a parish priest or anybody that would actually um, snitch on you in terms of your political leanings mm. um, in in either the Yorkist or the Lancastrian um, camps and, and your Lollard sympathies. <clears throat> so that's going to be an incredible personal and highly charged um, relationship, and which the two of them work uh, together and the lateral sorter from a little bit earlier it's the confessor who actually illustrates the book showing the coded agenda of of the lateral family at the time when they're on the wire and trying to promote the rise of the Lancastrian dynasty and the iconographies and the use of language is very much um, connected to that so there's a lot of, of precedent in which you can you can situate the experience of the Travisa Berkeley relationship. Thank you. Yeah, I'm guessing this also addresses the Exeter political agenda, which I love they mentioned in the chat. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, it was slightly more about um, the fact that the Exeter bishops were very much embedded with church and state. And from what, um, what was being said, Travisa came away from the church and state to the 
people, if you like. So did that mean that he was disowned by Exeter? And what impact, if any, did that have on Glasney? I mean, obviously, later on, much later on, when Glasney was dissolved, they were seen as being anti um, church and state and not proper clerics and all that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. 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 That's because they carry on doing it, of course. You look at the whole agendas of Bunan's K and, and Bunan's Mariatic, they're still doing it. They're still using language and culture and popularist movements within that to destabilise the, um, the church-state relationship. So, yeah, Glasney keep at it right up to the end. Yeah. Well, the Cornish have always been rebellious buggers, really, yeah. haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> <Still> are. <laughs> uh, and to my mind, that's that's Trevisa. I mean, he's as yeah. rebellious, he's as bolshy, he's opinionated, he's a proper yeah. Cornish. Yeah. <laughs> I think that sounds like a perfect summary, really. Um, so just a great spot to wrap it up here as well, then, I guess. Um, We've had some great discussion. It seems to be petering out now anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, huge breadth covered and it looks like there's definitely potential for far more discussions, especially about what, uh, the Cornish, what role the Cornish language plays in all of this. Uh, but for now, I guess we'll leave it here. Um, for those of you who are still left on the call, what we usually do as thank you for Robin is um, give a round of applause. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try and unmute everyone and then we can, um, yeah, thank Robin for an amazing talk. <laughs> thank you, thank you, folks. And thank, thank, you, and thank you for you. You, you asked questions that you know I would have wanted to ask as well. Throw in that there's so much in this story. Right. Let's let's just try and launch a whole new interest in understanding the conflict of that time. Great, great. Can I give a just a quick plug? You know, I said I'm in the chat that I'm doing a book ready for um, next year. That's because uh, we're, we're involved in some exhibitions, obviously, to bring um, some of the great Cornish iconic manuscripts back to Cornwall. And so the book is to come accompany the exhibitions. And so it, it looks at the relationship of different languages, as well as word and image, um, faith, art and science uh, throughout. The, the, the manuscript trail that we have for Cornwall before the Reformation. So there's going to be a, a lot, hopefully, of, of chances for us to, to continue this sort of debate um, in the course of the next coming year. Great. Thank would, you, Michelle. It would be great to have you come in and give us a talk about what it is that you're working on and what, what, what your book covers. Yeah, it, I think it would be interesting because uh, one of the things I'm doing at the moment also is, is bead and the theory of everything which is how you get past this sort of academic um, compartmentalization of, of, um, of humanities and sciences within syllabus. And those figures who actually um, try and bring it all together into a, a bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so how Trevisa sits in that would be another interesting thing. So at the very least, if you send us um, an email through with uh, more details about that, we're obviously yeah. happy to. Yeah, it's lovely yeah, to join you. Um, thanks, thanks, Robin, for, yeah. for bringing it to my attention. It's great fun. Really pleased that you could make it. Great. Thank you very much, then. Um, yeah, hopefully see you um, possibly next week, as I said. Um, details on that to follow. Uh, otherwise, we do have another talk coming up next month, um, for which details will be shared on all the usual channels as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much for coming along and sticking around for the discussion. Otherwise, the committee members usually stay on for uh, a couple of minutes now just to do a bit of a wrap up. But see everybody else later. Thanks, folks. Bye, Bye everyone. Cheers, all. <laughs>